the argument against it, and I think is that if you have a 32-year-old king, or maybe he's 33 by next year, who is crowned prince? You, you, you're not gonna, the way Saudi Arabia works, have a 50, 60-year-old crown prince. Um, so to have a team where the king is 33 and the crown prince is 30 is really un -Saudi. I mean, that much youth, so maybe he won't, but I, I still believe he, he will. So who is Mohammed bin Salman? Um, he is one of 12 sons of the current king. His older brothers from uh, an earlier wife went to school in the US, um, speak beautiful English, are um, in that sense very westernized. Uh, this young prince who is known um, in the kingdom as MBS for Mohammed bin Salman. MBS is entirely uh, Saudi educated. He went to King Saud University, graduating near the top of his class. He is, um, in addition to being crown prince, he is also the minister of defense. He is the economic czar. He oversees Saudi Aramco. Um, so Saudis refer to him as Mr. Everything. Um, and he indeed, no one uh, in the kingdom has had this kind of power since his grandfather um, fought a 30 year civil war from 1902 to 1932 to create the uh, third Saudi state, which is the kingdom in existence now. Um, the fact that he is young and that he is locally educated appeals to young Saudis and 70% of the population of Saudi Arabia is under 30 years of age. So it's an extremely young country. A year, 18 months ago, when I met him for the first time, he was um, just wearing a white thobe, none of the, the brown cloak that royals wear to look more regal. He was bareheaded. Um, had his hair pulled back in a little bun. Um, he met me in his office at 10 o'clock at night and at midnight he was uh, still going uh, strong. He um, is, the striking thing about him I think is his self-confidence. Um, he is by far the most self-confident uh, Saudi prince I've uh, ever met. And he's, you can ask him anything. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't say that's, I don't want to talk about that. Or he's very, um, very willing to explain himself and his uh, vision. He is a risk taker in a family that has, that is famous for um, slow consensus. Um, he seems well aware of the risks confronting the kingdom and understands the stakes of change, but I think he does believe that uh, the status quo is even more risky than uh, change. So in the past 18 months, he has literally done, Saudi Arabia, but he is the driver, has literally done things that there's been more change in the last two or three years than in the previous uh, um, 30 plus years I've been uh, going there. Um, specifically, he reduced energy subsidies to Saudis, which energy subsidies cost the government $60 billion a year. Um, gasoline prices were like 52 cents a gallon, and in essence, they have doubled and they're still not to uh, market levels, but that the Saudis notice that. He has imposed sin taxes on uh, cigarettes and soft drinks. There's obviously no alcohol to tax in the kingdom. Uh, he has imposed a VAT 
tax. And more controversially, he banned the religious police, the men that go around um, promoting virtue and forbidding vice, um, who keep young, keep men and women who aren't married from mixing, um, who in essence promote uh, their version of what proper Islam is. They can no longer arrest anyone. Um, so the society uh, in the last 18 months feels much freer because these men uh, are no longer roaming the streets. They are, they can be out there. I haven't seen any actually in my last two trips, but if they want to get someone for something, they have to go to a real police officer and point out the, the problem. He has also um, unleashed entertainment, and that probably doesn't sound like much to an audience in Boston who goes to a lot of entertainment, but in Saudi Arabia, the religious feel that entertainment is a distraction from devotion to Allah. So there are no cinemas, there are really no public entertainment, and they have begun to have um, concerts. I attended one uh, last October of a New York uh, dance group that mixed men and women on the stage and men and women in the audience, even more shockingly, and the female, the two female dancers had their breasts outlined in red lights. It was shockingly un-Saudi. Um, <clears throat> and uh, today, he has, the king has issued a decree allowing women to drive, uh, which has previously been kind of the third rail in Saudi Arabia. So by June of uh, next year, they will have worked out the details of this, they say, and um, <clears throat> uh, women will be able to get driver's license and, uh, and drive. <clears throat> um, at the Saudi National Day uh, three days ago in Saudi Arabia, they allowed women into stadiums for the first time in the history of the kingdom to attend um, musical events and fireworks and in essence they had what uh, one of the Saudi newspapers described as a day of joy. There were people shown dancing in the streets. Again, this doesn't sound like a big thing in a place like Boston, but um, it is a, <clears throat> a big thing in Saudi Arabia. So all of these things are, are rocking the foundations of Saudi society. People say, if you can sell a piece of Aramco, if you can ban the religious police, and now I'm sure if you can allow women to drive, what, what's coming uh, next? Uh, so gone is that preeminent authority of the religious officials. And those who have criticized this have by and large been silenced and uh, the others have uh, largely silenced themselves. Um, if how long that lasts obviously is a question, but if he manages to get away with allowing women to drive, I'm not sure where the religious police would be able to successfully, or the religious uh, leadership, draw the line. Um, so to me, the significance of the decision today on driving is that it is evidence that he is continuing to push forward. There is more social reform occurring than economic reform at this point. Um, and the lack of economic success could become a problem for the kingdom, but uh, he seems to be still uh, moving forward with his, um, with his plans. So, <clears throat> assessment. How likely is he to uh, succeed? Um, I think there are several things working for him. I already mentioned that oil prices being low, people understand that they can't live the life they used to. They're going to have to do something different. Young Saudis like the idea of reform because the government can no longer afford to hire them and they uh, need jobs. The 
under 30 group has very high unemployment. Some people say as high as 40%. Um, and um, third, there is this uh, driven young man with uh, what seems to be a determination to get stuff done. I think working against him is the, the same at some level um, inertia that, um, that worked against Mikhail Gorbachev when he tried to succeed a group of geriatric leaders uh, he obviously set out to save communism, not to destroy it, but it didn't, uh, uh, he, he didn't succeed. Both Saudi Arabia now and the old Soviet Union then, I think, should be seen as largely fossilized um, societies. And I think that's part of his reason for all the social change. He understands you have to change the society uh, the mindset before you can actually change uh, change the economy or anything else. Um, obviously, the task working against him is the foreign distractions. At some level, Yemen and Iran help provide support for the Saudi government at home, but they are a uh, they absorb money and they distract from the economic um, and, and transformational reforms he wants uh, to do. Um, so the things in the region are clearly, um, I think, a complication. Uh, he has uh, gotten Donald Trump back in um, the Saudi corner. Um, they, as you doubtlessly know, felt that President Obama was pro-Iranian and uh, the fact that uh, Trump is critical of uh, Iran uh, pleases the Saudis. So my bottom line as of this moment is I think he has, he still has a chance to do this. I mean, nobody, I uh, wouldn't profess to um, know enough about royal family politics because that's a very black box. Um, but there do not seem to be, there does not seem to be, a, while a lot of the other royals are unhappy about him, there is not a consensus among them about who would be, who they prefer, because many of them prefer themselves. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of would-be kings. Um, and I think that Saudis, even the ones who are unhappy with the, the um, pace of change or the lack of uh, economic uh, progress so far, do understand that the, um, the revolution they're going through is much preferable to the chaos that's going on in the rest of the region. So one of the big things that he has going for him is that Saudis say to themselves <clears throat> and to people like me, at least we're not killing each other. So there is a, a, a desire to, if you will, suck it up and, uh, and try to be patient. Um, so the vivid contrast between uh, regional chaos and the relative stability in the kingdom um, and between his energetic leadership and the lethargic leadership that Saudis have been used to for the last 30 years, um, give, I think, buy him time to actually try to accomplish some of his economic goals. And meanwhile, the social progress, while there are people who are against it, it is largely um, popular. And on that, I will take your questions. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for your assessment. What do you think is the strength that remains in the religious establishment? And how important might they be in staying this planned revolution of, uh, of the Crown Prince? I'm sorry, again, how, how much, what? What is the strength that remains in the religious, uh, in the conservative religious establishment? How important are they in possibly staying the hand of the crown mm -hmm. prince? Mm -hmm. 
Um, everybody heard the question. Uh, uh, I think you cannot assume that the religious are all going to quietly um, go away. Um, the announcement about women driving today, it was said that the Senior Council of Religious Scholars approved that. Um, they may have, um, but perhaps holding their nose. Um, so I think so far, as I said, ha they have not um, tried to mobilize people against this. King Salman is very popular with the religious establishment. Whether that transfers to his son uh, remains to be seen. But I think you can't, you can't say they're in a cage and because they are the one group that can mobilize Saudis. And given that he's locally educated, as you mentioned, do you foresee him making changes or reforms in Saudi higher education and how that might prevail over the years? Of See who making? Oh, King, King Salman, uh, Crown Prince, uh, given that he's locally educated mm -hmm. and given validation to the university there, King Saud University. Uh, do you see him making great investments say, in higher education? They say they are going to, um, but under King Abdullah, they had big education reform plans domestically, and of course, King Abdullah sent 200,000 Saudis abroad um, to this country and others for education, and I, that, that did provide uh, some air and opening up in the education system, but <laughs> just one tiny, they have just, some Saudi textbook has a picture of the late King Faisal with um, Yoda, the little, uh, and uh, the, the man who produced the textbooks has just been fired because here is the king in a, sitting beside uh, little Yoda and some Saudi artist actually produced it. He's not the one who put it in the book. So education remains very, um, very much in the minds of the religious under their purview. Um, so they said they changed textbooks, but when I was doing my book, talking to people about the education officials, you know, they were saying how they're going to have entirely new textbooks by 2013, but that um, when you close the door. Nobody knows what goes on in the classroom, the teacher's in charge. Um, they are now, this young man has, uh, they have fired some professors uh, just within the last week that they allege are Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so edu education is under, uh, under review, um, but it is, it's, a, it's a difficult one to us to assume there will be rapid change in. And the fact that uh, m many young people aren't trained for the jobs that the kingdom needs is one of their problems of reforming. They don't have, they have some well-educated university graduates, um, but they don't have a lot of um, below the top layer of educated uh, People, the country's literate, but uh, people aren't educated. They're educated in Arabic literature and Islamic studies and things that don't get you a job. Yes, I wonder if you could shed a little light on the um, current situation and maybe some historical background between uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and address what does it mean for the United States? And address uh, what does the current situation um, what about mean the, for, the, for the U.S.? What it means for the U.S.? Correct. Uh, I confess, I find the whole dispute inexplicable. Um, and the only thing that um, makes sense to me um, is that in this dispute with Qatar over their they support fundamentalists um, and the Muslim Brotherhood is um, in part designed to make, allow for what has gone on in Saudi Arabia in the last few weeks, the crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, 
but it, it, because it makes no sense to me that you would get that upset over unhappiness that in 1995 the Qataris changed their king and this made the Saudis feel vulnerable and Al Jazeera they don't like and they don't like Al Jazeera but so I'm I cannot explain it is the short answer uh, because to me it doesn't make any any sense I'm still trying to figure out and I'm hoping I'm going there next week I'm hoping somebody there can explain to me why it's worth the tension. I think for the U.S., um, it is not good, obviously, given that uh, Qatar is where the U.S. Uh, air base is. I think the Saudis would be happy to have the U.S. air base back in Saudi Arabia, which is where it was pre-2005. So maybe that's their goal, to get, get it out of Qatar and back in Saudi Arabia. I don't know. Uh, but. It's a long-winded, I don't know answer. Sorry. Um, yeah, you said that um, you thought that in the next year, the uh, current King Salman would abdicate so that his 32-year-old son would um, definitely become king. But the, the current king is, like all of them since 1932, have been sons of mm -hmm. Abdul Aziz. Mm -hmm. And um, the current one is, a, is also one of the Sudari Seven. So I'm just wondering why, um, you think that the abdication is necessary for them to lock in um, the the kingship? Like, is is there, or is do you, do you fear that there's going to be a coup or something? Uh, no, but I think you know the the king, as you say, one of the sons of Abdul Aziz, um, wants his son, a grandson of Abdul Aziz, to become king. There are still other sons of Abdul Aziz alive, including the king's full brother, one of the Suderi seven, uh, who thinks he should be king. Um, so I think it, they want to, he wants to make sure that the family doesn't take advantage of his death to pick someone else among them, perhaps his brother or uh, a, a different nephew uh, and the only way I mean I could be totally wrong about this but a lot of Saudis also think the same thing but the only way you can be absolutely sure is if you're alive and, and you you do the handover um, the family is clearly not happy um, with the fact that he was deputy crown prince and now crown prince because the king has already removed two crown princes in the last, since he became king, so in the last two and a half years. So if you are um, another, a third crown prince could get removed and someone else become kings. I think it's just, you know, to be, to be certain. The argument against it, and I think is that if you have a 32-year-old king, or maybe he's 33 by next year, who is crown prince? You, you, you're not gonna, the way Saudi Arabia works, have a 50, 60-year-old crown prince. Um, so to have a team where the king is 33 and the crown prince is 30 is really un-Saudi. I mean, that much youth, so maybe he won't, but I, I still believe he, he will. The king is coming here in January. Um, so my assumption is that before that or after that, it will happen. No, no, he's coming to the US. He's coming to see Donald Trump, not Boston to my knowledge. Do you think the new crown prince would actually dare attempt to improve relations with Israel? And if so, do you think he could actually succeed and the second question is, what future do you see in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Russia? Um, the Saudi king is going to Russia on October 4th, 5th, 6th, um, I believe, or 3rd through 7th, right in there. Um, and they, they clearly are trying to, as much as they're happy with Donald Trump's uh, 
anti-Iran um, stance, I think, you know, they, they do see that it makes sense in their minds to hedge their bets. They've improved relations with China. Uh, this crown prince went to Russia as deputy crown prince a year and a half ago. Um, so I think, uh, you know, you can assume that the Russians and the Saudis will at least talk to each other more and visit each other more. And they have oil to try to cooperate on because Russia, oil too, is their only real source of revenue and they both need the price higher and so they have a, they have a common um, goal in that. On Israel, I think, um, you know, clearly the Saudis and Israelis share a common suspicion, if not uh, um, enmity uh, for Iran. Um, and I, I believe that there are conversations that go on and I assume uh, intelligence sharing. I think it's probably hard for Saudi Arabia to um, go go visit uh, Jerusalem uh, until something happens on the Palestinian issue. But the Palestinian issue for all the Arabs, I would say, has become much less potent than it was uh, 30 years ago or, or right after. Sadat went to Jerusalem and that was supposed to solve the problem. I mean, the, the Arabs still have to give uh, lip service to the Palestinian issue, but I don't think it occupies them or their populace uh, as much as it did 30 years ago. Thank you. I, I, it was a terrific talk, thank you. One of the things in, in the American newspapers, news magazines, is the export of Wahhabism uh, to Central, Central Asia, to uh, the Far East, uh, and to these Islamic countries that are really not very aggressive. And this is a problem. Do you see this continuing with the new, the new crown prince? The, the spread of Wahhabism? Yes. Uh, that's the balancing act the royal family and the religious have to do um, because the legitimacy of Al Saud rule is that we are the protectors and perpetuators of the one true Islam as uh, propounded by Ibn Abdul Waha who is, goes back and tries to bring the prophet's real Islam. Um, so they have always had some um, desire, obviously, to please the religious. I think this current regime is, seems to be trying to reduce the clout of the religious scholars um, and to create legitimacy in family rule by um, patriotism, by I'm a Saudi. I mean, these National Day celebrations are not new, but there are uh, much more emphasis put on them, and by um, hoping to reform the, the mindset of people. Um, how much that works, I don't know, but I don't think that, I think they do many of them at least are beginning to understand that the export of um, fundamentalist Wahhabism has not uh, been successful for them either. How much they cut back, I don't know. It's one of the things one always um, watches. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Round of applause.